Hi, my name is Mark Ward, Festival Programmer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Redline Book Festival. This festival is brought to you by South Dublin Libraries and Arts with support from Creative Ireland. This year, we are delighted to have Tala native Keith Payne as our writer in residence for the Redline Book Festival 2020. In this event, Keith will be reading from his work in progress and all the savage acres no one could predict, a collection of poems based around Tala. Be sure to check out Keith's Poetry Roundtable with Judy O'Kane and Jane Clark taking place on Saturday. But for now, please welcome Keith Payne. How you doing? Uh, my name is Keith Payne. I am the Redline Book Festival writer in residence for 2020. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, the Redline Book Festival organizers, all the staff at South Dublin County Council uh, Libraries, excuse me, and the programmer from the festival, not only for the residency and my uh, chance to come back to Tala and work there, um, but also for this festival uh, in its ninth year now, um, and really showing uh, year on year uh, a great, inclusive, uh, and exciting program. Um, I'd also specifically like to mention my workshop uh, students uh, who have come week on week, and especially since the uh, new lockdown uh, where we've taken everything online as this festival and it really really makes a huge difference to us to the teachers to the poets uh, to the people organizing these things that you sign on and that you turn up and you log on and we can see your face in the small box and that you come open-minded uh, to enjoy yourselves and to read and especially to write so this is dedicated to to all my students thanks very much guys uh, and, and here's to two more weeks of hard work so, uh, this reading is uh, from a work in progress, which is called All the Savage Acres No One Could Predict. And the line is from an Ivan Boland poem uh, called Irish Poetry, which she dedicated to the wonderful Michael Hartnett. Um, so I'll read, I'd like to read that poem. I'd like to start this reading with Ivan and Michael and a sense of where those savage acres are coming from. So maybe we can locate them before we launch uh, into the reading fully. So this is uh, in memory of Ivan and, and to thank her and Michael for all the poems. Irish Poetry from Michael Hartnett. We always knew there was no Orpheus in Ireland, no music stored at the doors of hell, no God to make it. No wild beasts to weep and lie down to it. But I remember an evening when the sky was underworld dark at four. When ice had seized every part of the city and we stopped talking, the air making a wreath for our cups of tea. And we began to talk of our own gods, our heartbroken pantheon. No added light for them and no Herodotus, but thin rain, dogfish, and the stock gap of the sharp cliffs they spent their winter on. And the pitch black Atlantic night, how the sound of a bird's wing in a lost language sounded. We made a noise for me. We made it again until I could see the flight of it. Suddenly the silvery lithe rivers of the southwest lay down in silence and the savage acres no one could predict were all at ease, soothed and quiet, and listening to you as I was, as if to music, as if to peace. And the great Ivan Boland, uh, who we all miss dearly, so I found myself uh, uh, digging around those savage acres uh, some time ago um, and I realised growing up in the corner house, I grew up in Tala uh, in Kingswood Heights and our house was the corner house, number 34 in the Garth. And when you go to dig in your garden, you realize the builders have dropped all the rubbish, the construction dross, the scree, the junk 
into your garden and they've covered it with a thin veneer of topsoil. So uh, when you go digging, uh, you find yourself coming across all that uh, building rubble that go, went up to, made, uh, to make the estates. Uh, but if you dig on, uh, especially in the case of Tala, you'll dig down through uh, the Cayley Day, who were the um, sect, the Christian sect in St. Melrune's Monastery that was established by Melrune in 782, I think, and then taken over by Angus, who wrote the great book of Tala that you can go and see uh, on Dawson Street. Um, You'll dig down even further and come to the plague, uh, the burial place of the plague, which is where Tala gets its name, and Tavlok, uh, and obviously quite a common name around there. So this was my way into uh, these suburban savage acres. Um, and, and from there, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on digging and we'll keep on nosing around the corners of the pebble-dashed walls to see where we go. So I'd like to open with uh, my mother sows three seeds in a suburban garden. Before they headed off, the builders planted shrubs over the whole estate's construction screen. And woe betide the mother who tried to dig for spuds. There wasn't gravelly ground, she found, as her garden centre spade cut cleanly through the urban sprawl of insulating foam, the lonely flapping tongue of a cement bag tacked struggling through the dross. When she straightened up to ease her back and cast her eye out over the breeze block wall, down along her neighbours' garden walls, their parcel washing glinting on the line, she knew their perfect lawns, the clean magnolia finish on their walls, were down to the dump they made of her corner site. And so on she dug. Past broken slates and concrete caked, past the bend in a copper pipe, the cracks in the bricks of glass moire, the off cuts from a pitch pine ceiling, and down to the tempered ground that was trampled down by the dancing Cayley day, and down in the ground where the dead men go to the maggot feeding plays. Till her spade sparked off the bedrock, and there she lay. She placed three seeds, each in their own collarbone hollow of stone, then turned squatted and peed, heaving all the muck and dirt back over. And she sang to herself, oh, they can keep their perfect lawn. The neighbour's one-eyed cat surveyed the mess she made and saw it all through scent of loam and spade. Um, many of the uh, beginning poems the, from the first section of, of, of All the Savage Acres are imagining uh, the lives or the possible lives lived behind the homogenous uh, pebble dash, breeze block walls with black capstones, uh, mullioned windows, nets and curtains, and I suppose allowing uh, for, for some of what could be called a, a magic realism, I think, uh, in behind those magnolia painted walls. So I'm going to read you now uh, three poems, three short anatomies of suburbia, I suppose you could call them. Uh, and we'll see where we go from there, okay? Lucy's work took her as far. Lucy's work took her as far as the garden shed. She often stood at the hall mirror to cut her fringe on the way out. There was nowhere to sit in her shed, just a gas ring for Lucy would fry button mushrooms. On the way to work, she picked up all the leaves that had fallen from the apple tree in her garden 
and pour them into a vat of clear glue. She rolled into a sheet that she hung in the line, just to let the light shine through. Thrust as he might his hands into his cardigan pockets. Thrust as he might his hands into his cardigan pockets. He simply cannot resist the charge of children strafing the estate. As he watches them from behind his mullioned windows. On a street full of mullioned windows. Lifting the lid on the turntable, he slides the arm over the plate. The needle picks up every abandoned hair and dust mold, crackles and spits as the music lifts into the room, and he listens with sympathy to the tympanum in the orchestra. The symphony swells. He slips out of his argyle socks, and the tongue and groove ceiling opens to receive him. And he is lifted into the mystic. He relished the chance to marvel. He relished the chance to marvel at his kitchen cabinets, the soft closing drawers, the toki, the red lacquer finish that showed his reflection as he walked through the door and sat at his very own kitchen island to a HB Vionetta ice cream. It crackled as the cake slice cleaved through the glacial chocolate layers. But this was just the tip of desserts to come. There was a whole sorbet of palate, an endless cascade of profiteroles, and before long, he'd be striding back from the garden shed with creme brulee in his head and a blowtorch in his hand. So that's just a, a taste, a sample of um, some of the uh, uh, poems of suburbia from all the Savage Acres. Um, and these poems are, are, are based partially on memory, obviously, uh, driven by imagination, uh, and also uh, there's a lot of research into so the great work done by the likes of Ellen Rowley out in UCD and Ruth McManus in DCU and also Erica Hanna who's in Leicester. Um, researchers, uh, scholars, academics who are uh, mapping for us through what's known as the built environment or the built stock or object culture. Uh, that great period of the mid 70s to the mid 80s when uh, the vast estates of Tala, Clodoghan, uh, Lucan and Blanchestown were built um, because they had looked at the map and realized we could, they couldn't build north because the airport was there and they knew that was going to expand. They couldn't go east uh, because you're the Irish Sea. And the only way was south as far as Bornabrina and the Wicklow Mountains, the Dublin Mountains, and build in there. At the same time, Decade of the 60s, uh, we had a 120% increase in car use, where we had a 90% decrease in bicycle use. Um, everything was, 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 was based on the car. Um, as Miles Wright, who drafted the Dublin Regional Plan in 67, wrote numerous times in that plan, uh, people will vote with their wheels. At the same time, we were also joining the European Union who I think for obliged us in order to join to open our banking regulations to an international uh, market. At the time coming up to join the EU, Ireland had one of the greatest social housing schemes in Europe. And the period of the mid 70s to mid 80s was the very rapid dismantling of that, uh, literally brick by brick. Um, while at the same time opening up uh, lending to international markets, profiteering markets, essentially. And that radically changed how we live, how we thought about how we live. Um, and in fact, what was offered 
was 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 the beginning of um, what we have now with with a housing market as opposed to home building. Um, so before I go to those particular poems, I'd like to read a few more from uh, the early stages of of uh, all the son Jacobs. And this first one uh, really is inspired by my mother. Uh, she was one of those women who, when she came in the door from work in the evening, before she took off her coat or her doctor bag, she would be picking up bits of fluff or bits of dirt uh, along the carpet, would have gone in, cleaned out the grate and set the fire, probably washed a couple of cups on the sideboard, and then she'll, she'll take her coat off and put the kettle on. So this is uh, dedicated to Keith Payne. Kate Bain, excuse me. Some nights she came home. Some nights she came home when the house was gone. So hanging, hanging her coat on a branch, she grabbed a trowel and set to laying blocks. Great course after course she laid, till she stepped into the hallway. She papered the plasterboard walls of the hall stairs and landing. The cornice was the tricky bit. Then switching on the kettle as her kids turned in their sleep, the stars wheeling in the sky above, she went to the garden that had grown itself together again and hung the washing on the line. At ten to two, he felt the wheel. At ten to two, he felt the wheel under his hands as he eased his powder blue Mercedes through the avenue, the rise and the court. Tires turning past the new shops, the tiny toothed wheel of his Seiko wristwatch ticking back and forth and back and forth. As he turns the wheel of the car, the sun and stars etched out of the watch's face reveal its inner workings. It's got him where he was today. The crease in his blue serge suit, crisp as a church collection packet. Um, some of you may remember waking up one morning in the early 1980s and finding about a half inch of sand covering everything, covering all the cars in the driveways, all the driveways, the gardens, those black capstones. And this uh, was the first occurrence of its of its kind in 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 uh, at least in recorded history in Ireland, where due to uh, a sandstorm in Algeria and various climatic conditions, uh, Saharan sand was blown north and landed uh, uh, came down in the, in the rain um, in a fairly clear line from Mallow up to Tala and south of there. It was in in uh, 1982, I think. So this, uh, this poem, uh, I suppose, remembers that and considers the, 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 the movement of that Saharan sand. He rooted the fly sheet out from the tent bag. He rooted the fly sheet out from the tent bag and stretched it between the decorative wishing well, the bolts in the wall and the washing line. News had reached him of a sandstorm in Algeria. High pressure over Spain and France and a low front out over the Atlantic that together blew the Saharan sand north, where it fell as quartz held in great globules of rain that crashed onto the new hatchbacks parked in the estate. Timing it just right, he filtered the sand into a quality street tin. Sand he worked well into his green terrarium, bedding his succulents in. Then rivered a layer of silver gravel over the surface as the fragile roots took hold in their new home. Mm. I'm, 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 I'm finding myself becoming obsessed, or at the very least, very interested in the object culture of that period and also of this period. And so these poems are littered with, with terrariums, 
uh, quality street tins, mullion windows, uh, kitchen islands, uh, sodium vapor street lamps, uh, garden gates, rockeries, capstones, breeze blocks, washing lines, uh, black and decker drills, black and decker strimmers, uh, black and decker workbenches. Um, and I guess in that, that very long tradition, you know, through Heady and through Hardy and beyond, uh, just that idea that, that, that the very simple and very quotidian object can uh, say so much to us and so much to so many of us. Uh, and anybody who will recall uh, HB or Wall's Viennetta ice cream uh, uh, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this is called Confined to a House of Flying Daggers. Confined to a house of flying daggers, she watched the movie of herself flickering on the bedroom wall. And out the window where she scaled the sodium vapour street lamp. Her loose-fitting pants snapping in the breeze as the bus pulled up and emptied the trundling neighbours onto the green. The movies would have her believe that real heroines don't fight, but face one another across an open space. The green bamboo creaking in the breeze, where they would bow and play the whole thing out in their heads. Elbows and fists, the snarl and twist of the head that always managed to miss the habitual kick, and on through the long hours till one caught the other's measure and gained the upper fist. But neither had moved an inch. Their eyes were closed throughout, not a flick of the wrist. So both had missed the flapping end of the reel, where she slips back through the bedroom window, nimble, quiet, to lay on her eiderdown to sleep. She'd been reading all about the upper strata. She'd been reading all about the upper strata from her sitbed, the swirling oxblood knots, the sedimentary rocks turning in on themselves, and right at the top, you'd as likely find seahorse hoof prints and old blowholes puffing from down below. Yet she couldn't say what drew her back to class as she orbited from the polished corridors in her very sensible shoes. Whirly gigging on the chance of oxbow lakes on one of Saturn's moons, on the under the surface rivers rising to wash it all away. Or the class terrarium that stood on the nature table. The tiny bubbles hung along the bell jars curved, and the succulents within, twitching in their bed of silver gravel, breathing through the classroom fog, past desks, and the teacher who stood on his genuine leather uppers, and out to the hollowways that lined the savage acres. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a guy by the name of Miles Wright, he was professor of Liverpool University uh, in Geography in 67, and he was commissioned by the then Minister for Local Government uh, to make a regional study of Dublin. Uh, they knew that we needed, within, within the space of a decade, upwards of, of, of 60,000 homes. Uh, at the time, they still called them homes. Um, and so this, this professor, Miles Wright, was commissioned and he wrote up the uh, Dublin Regional Plan, which uh, makes for entertaining reading if, 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 if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and what stands out so clearly in his regional plan is, as I said, uh, everything is based on the motor car. I mean, the models for these housing estates, these vast housing programs, are of course the model city, the model town, the UK idea. Uh, which in turn borrowed so much from Robert Moses uh, in New York, who just cleared 
whole vast communities in, in New York City and, and built those disastrous projects. Um, and it was also essentially based on the idea that the Victorian notion that if you build a good house and you give someone a good house, all social ills will be cured. Um, and there was no mention, and there is no mention of any uh, government or planning documents uh, to do with culture or entertainment or recreation. Although, although Miles does talk about recreation, but he talks about, he talks about getting in a car and driving to the coast or driving to the mountains. But in the actual place where people were going to live, there was zero consideration of this. Um, and a kind of, uh, and a kind of very, really, really quick period, we went from um, pre-independence, where speculative builders and speculative uh, development were the order of the day, to that glorious period in the 1930s when the corporation were building projects like the Drumcondra scheme, Merino, uh, Cabra, Crumlin, uh, and rapidly to the 70s, where we, we, we handed back uh, our construction, our building of homes and communities back to speculators. Um, and the language you can see in these documents is, is, is so clear uh, and so rancid, really. Um, so the next two poems I'll read are uh, an attempt at the moment uh, to use that language directly from uh, planning legislation and from Wilde's Rights uh, Regional Programme. Okay, this first is called, this phrase is intended to express the unity of the area. The growth rates predicted in the second program have not been fulfilled, and this may call for some adjustment. We have not sought to make an adjustment ourselves because the program is metropolitan, the most convenient, a novel way of guiding development naturally, in a most economical way. Positive guidance beyond dormitory estates towards the rapid use of motor cars in a few chosen places. Growth and change thereafter are certain once our great change is made. We will see our place in the scheme of things. We must see our place in the scheme of things because one of the certainties of planning is that prosperity, once achieved, will spread. In our view, this growth is practicable, even reasonable, in certain districts. We have in mind small industries, modernization, new housing and schools in a favourable location at a lower cost. No boundary can be laid for such an area. The placid Boyne, the deeper Liffey, the mountains and coasts and many areas of great beauty near which lie over a million people, all dependent for their livelihood on the orderly guidance of regional growth. And this, the motor age. Uh, and shall finish with um, how are we for time? I think we're good. I'll finish with two poems, okay? The first of which is uh, from a Rexine sofa. Some of you may remember Rexine sofa, a kind of a fake leather uh, or a pleather that uh, they made couches out of, jackets out of, the interior of trains, the interior of cars, it was everywhere. Uh, it was invented by an Englishman, I think, um, and General Motors in the UK uh, used it for all the interiors of the cars. And in the summer, uh, with a pair of shorts on, you'd stick to the sofa. But there is, um, especially if you're staring at a TV from that sofa, there's a whole world beyond the rec scene. Uh, so I'll read this and then I'll finish with uh, Sunday dinners after that. He slid off the Rexine sofa and waded into the lagoon, floating down through the particles to where the Roman heads, no Roman heads, no fluted columns, just shopping trolleys lay. 
he glides effortlessly over the smooth egg stones and all the buried black encased cables to an altarpiece in base relief and binny salam stone looming up through the water while above in the distance dissenters trundle past on the 1548 express soaked through he finally reaches the far shore where she is waiting in the sand they sit together to watch the rare earth show that without exception begins every evening at seven bleary eyed blanket wrap they've been living beyond their means they sit side by side and wait for the rare earth show to commence before i finish uh, once more i'd like to thank all of you uh, for joining me here today and for joining uh, some of the great readings and discussions that will be going on as part of the red line book festival in its ninth year i believe and such a broad range and breadth and depth of programming that it is uh, a massive credit to to uh, its programmers and one of the many great things the many great things to come out of tala so i'll finish this and i'll say thanks uh, with a short poem called a suburban sunday we never talked about hunger strikes in our house Back home after the pub, the Sunday Times crossword done, while your man twirled around the tables with issues of unfoblocked held up to his chest. You'd buy one, leave it on the table, and later varnish over the fact. But I had eyes only for orange Fanta, that unicorn and then more black pints. Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the festival.